host disabled uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. So you guys need to uh, enable that, I think. Is it not working now, Michael? Mm, not yet. Uh, let me see. Oh, here okay. we go. Here we go. Okay. So you can see this now? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I sort of feel as though I'm in a dystopian sci-fi movie. I've got big billowing black clouds out here in Little Village in Coromandel in New Zealand. And um, I know uh, in London, I don't know whether your prime minister is still party partying under party gate, probably not at this point. Um, but in New Zealand, we are at the beginning of a lockdown um, with the Omicron virus, the first cases being registered here in New Zealand. Uh, and we uh, have done very well. The Prime Minister, I think, of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, has done very well, the Labour cabinet, of keeping it out. Um, we have, you know, one of the fewest uh, number of dead in the world for it, but still um, there are people who are profoundly emotionally affected by it and some crazies who actually want, who have threatened to kill the Prime Minister here. Um, <laughs> So, you know, this is, it seems to be an apocalyptic moment, really. Um, and I really want to address this topic as an opportunity to look at the philosophy of education in a time of crisis. Um, and I, I, I say here, um, basically, uh, here, the end is nigh, uh, a deep Western philosophical and religious narrative that structures our culture, psyche, being and time. And I think that this is, a, this is the note on which I really want to begin the kind of uh, revision to philosophy of education in this, uh, in this environment. I, I, and I think it frame, frames our consciousness in so many different ways. Um, and the theme now of surviving the end of the world has been a theme for at least a couple of thousand years, two and a half thousand years, um, the end times, the end game, a kind of in today's um, era, it, for me, it signals the crisis in particular of, of industrial society. And perhaps also, if we're lucky, the profound shift from industrial to digital and perhaps the green society. And I think in, in, in our terms, this means digital and green education, the two forces really that now drive culture, the new biology, genomic science, and of course, information science, information and algorithmic science. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why it resonates so much is that, of course, um, it is a biblical um, a narrative, and uh, uh, many evangelical Christians now um, linked to the far right in the United States believe uh, this is the time that Christ is going to come back to earth, um, and you know, um, and they are, they are buying into um, this um, end times emotionally and intellectually. But if there is to be a transition, it won't be an easy one. And it's not inevitable. It will be protracted. In my view, it'll be protracted um, decades and uneven, probably involving a struggle against various lobbies, the oil and gas lobby, who have dominated the top 500 companies in the world um, since the beginning of the industrial age. So with that, the end is nigh. Of course, it derives from a man who could be seen walk, walking up and down London's Oxford Street wearing a sandwich board or carrying a plaque out on a pole. The end is nigh. It's a, it is a prophecy. It's, you know, it, it promises a temporal end to our, earth, our earthly condition. It promises... Um, this promise conditions our history and culture. It's in our literature and philosophy. 
And I, I would go so far as to say it's the defining feature of the West. Here are some images uh, that we can see here, sci-fi ones, the you know, Easter Island image, which is very, um, um, you know, has been very important to Jared Diamond's work. Um, the meltdown of cities, the effects of, um, um, of an end of world um, disaster in the cities. Um, uh, and even also, <laughs> I, I've just been reading this, um, um, the best places to, vast, to survive civilizational collapse. Uh, I see that New Zealand is mentioned there, and I know that some of the, um, the Silicon Valley people, uh, billionaires, uh, have bought up land in New Zealand to survive the aftermath. But at the same time, we have to realize how we are saturated with these images. It affects our consciousness. You know, the, the zombie theme um, in our, in our uh, television and um, film work has been there for many years now. Um, and, you know, the, the, that's a very, that's a very um, fecund field for lots of ideas around, around this theme. I, I want to talk about really here a group of recent contributions um, on complexity, collapse, and catastrophe. And I mentioned here um, six recent books um, that deal with um, this question. Um, and in particular, Pablo Cervigny, uh, Raphael Stevens, How Everything Can, can Collapse. Um, it was, um, it's a runaway academic bestseller. Uh, the second one published during the same year, another end of the world is possible. So, and you have this uh, rustic image of a, um, a cottage uh, uh, growing, growing trees on it and so on um, in a meadow. Um, and this is, you know, one of the last places on earth that people, uh, people are surviving. Uh, and of course you have, the, uh, um, you know, a whole range of others as well. Uh, it's certainly up there. It's a very well traversed, theme and of course people uh, are cashing in on it. Um, they're writing their, their books and papers about it, uh, just as I am, um, trying to describe uh, what it looks like. And there are uh, many, um, I've mentioned a couple here because they're both British, uh, research centers. Uh, here, the one um, called the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, um, you know, this is managed, dedicated to the, the study and the mitigation of risk that could lead to human extinction or civilizational collapse. And they look at technological risk, bio risk, environmental risk, AI, the risk from AI, global justice, a science of global risk. Uh, and the emphasis here in the literature now that's emerging is the attempt to use complexity theory to talk about global risk. And the other one here at Oxford, the Future of Humanity Center, um, recognizing the multidisciplinary aspect of recent research, the tools of mathematics, philosophy, and social sciences to bear on the big picture questions about survival of humanity, um, headed up by Nick Bostrom. And here again, AI, AI safety, governance, and biosecurity are the top topics. Of course, here, um, Martin Rees's uh, work uh, has been around astronomer, uh, British astronomer. Um, he's been on record since 2013, <laughs> talking about our final century. Um, what happens? Do Can we survive it? Um, and, and I think that his comments are very interesting because we are talking about uh, an astrological background that exists, that's already there, the risks are inherent, and we can't change them. And he says here, if I'm allowed to quote him, our planet may be insignificant on a cosmic scale, but the evolution of intelligent life here makes it unusual. It is likely to be unique in our galaxy. Yet, we may be on the verge of destroying it, of destroying ourselves over the next century. The future of life in the cosmos could be jeopardized or safeguarded for perpetuity. So if you haven't seen his work, 
Uh, go on the TED Talk uh, I've included here is this our final century uh, and have a listen to him. He's a very eloquent thinker and speaker. Um, and, you know, from, from one of the um, sites here is a kind of table of global catastrophic risks divided up into the technological, sociological, ecological, biological, astronomical, eschatological, uh, fictional, and others, um, so on. And it gives you some kind of understanding of the mosaic uh, that has emerged around the future of the Earth and the, the ultimate fate of Earth as a planet in our solar system. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, it gives you also a, a set of a possible interconnections between these views. It shows you already, um, it shows us already, the, um, the interdisciplinary nature, the hugely complex interdisciplinary na nature of, um, of, this, um, of assessing uh, these global catastrophic risks. Um, I hope to come back to that. Maybe we won't get uh, too much chance to do that. This is a, a once over lightly because I don't want to spend too much time talking and I'd much rather uh, face some questions and uh, some discussion. So <clears throat> let's go back to the concept of collapse. It was developed first by, well, not first, but a very, in a very definite way by Joseph Tainter in his book, The Collapse of Complex Societies where he was pretty um, unimpressed with the models uh, he called the, the dinosaur, uh, which is a depletion of world resources with no plan for the future. The runaway train, which depends of, of, on constant growth, um, again, with little plan for the future. The so-called house of cards, which is, becomes, the society becomes so complex, it becomes unstable. He dismisses the these three options as all superficially useful. And then he advances four axioms to understand, um, to best characterize collapse, that human societies are problem solving organizations, that socio-political systems require energy for their maintenance, um, that increased complexity carries with it increased costs per capita, and investment in social and, and political complexity uh, as a problem-solving response reaches a point of declining marginal returns. Uh, really, um, one of his um, uh, most important axioms there. And thus, uh, collapse is a sudden loss of social complexity, stratification, internal and external communication, and exchange in productivity. So he says straight up, Collapse is a political process. A society, he says, has collapsed when it displays a rapid significant loss of an established level of socio-political complexity. The collapse in turn must be rapid, taking no more than a few decades. Whoops. Um, so we also know Jared Diamond's um, wonderful um, contribution, both anthropologists, I know, um, collapse how human societies choose to fail or succeed. Um, and he says, uh, you know, summarizing a drastic decrease in human population size and or political, economic, social complexity over a considerable area for an extended period of time. So avoiding collapse. Um, and I think this is worth reading the courage to practice long-term thinking, to make bold, courageous, anticipatory decisions at a time when problems have become perceptible, but before they reach crisis proportions. And then the second one, the courage to make painful decisions about values, which of the values that formerly served the society well can, uh, can continue to main, be maintained under new change circumstances. This is under the section Reasons for Hope. Now, being largely an anthropologist here, I think the practice of long-term thinking, um, when I read these two propositions, I have in mind, uh, in the back of my head, uh, questions about philosophy of education. 
uh, crucial, it seems to me, to both propositions. And also, uh, it fills me with dread because anticipatory decisions um, at a time when problems have become perceptible, I think of COPE 26, uh, the failure uh, of that, and the way in which there were thousands of oil and gas lobbyists at that conference trying to water down um, any real consens world consensus. Um, with, I think we're going we're gonna to face that for sure, not a, without a doubt. So I, I, I come back, and I'm, I hope this is not too um, elementary for you, um, but ecology really, uh, as a science of ecosystems, um, I take it from one of Springer's reference works here. I'm going to skate over it. <clears throat> but I think it's worth realizing the concept of complexity as a structure with variability over a wide range of scales, um, where, which can produce complex structures from simple interactions. And so you, the, living, the living systems of collections of entity at multiple scales that undergo a wide variety of interactive processes and a large number of unique parts. So, you know, um, and we have a set, a set of concepts here, which could be very useful uh, in talking about philosophy of education, stability versus complexity, Resil ecolo ecological resilience, thresholds, non-linearities, which are the core of sciences of complexity um, and fundamentalist relationship between um, complexity and stability. Of course, the social sciences are used to um, the concept of networks for many, many years now, but we must also look more carefully at theories of self-organization, synergetics, uh, dynamic systems, turbulence, catastrophes, instabilities, and so on. Uh, and of course, this is a stochastic process of, you know, forms of uh, mathematical modeling for, um, for all of these, um, for all of these things. Um, I, I think what we're, what, what the ecologists, um, particularly the statistical ecologists are maintaining the deep structural similarities between different phenomena, including uh, the structure of the universe, the biological basis of consciousness, uh, the integration of genomics, uh, you know, the limits of computing and so on. So I just raised those questions. There's a set of concepts there that I think philosophers of education need to get used to using. And I, I give some contemporary examples here. So, you know, please, um, you know, you can share these sources um, and of course the, um, the slides. Um, now, how common it is to talk about end of days, uh, Western civilization in particular, although it's not just Western, of course, um, but the Judaic Christian um, biblical apocalypse, apocalyptic narrative is Western, of course. Um, how do you know when a society is about to fall apart? And of course, beginning, um, you know, in this um, 10 years, um, people beginning to talk about beyond collapse and re resilience, revitalization and transformation in complex societies. So, you know, uh, that theme, uh, which is what I'm addressing, um, provides a, a theme to the systematic approach to collapse, and in particular to the collapse of industrial society. So I think we have, you know, and this is taken earlier, a scatological theory uh, going back um, not only to, um, to uh, you know, Christian sources, the book of Daniel, Revelation, and so on, Ezekiel, um, civilizational theory, you know, particularly that which ensues, um, but, but earlier from Edward Gibbons, the rise and decline, um, and Arnold Toyn Toyn of Rome, of course, of Toynbee's work, Spengler and, and, and Wittgenstein, and of course, uh, you know, Jonas and, 
and there it are. So ecological theory has been around for a long time, biological theory, uh, the sociological uh, and, and technological around the concept of techno singularity, it's super intelligence. Um, and I think um, increasingly, uh, I, I've tried to write about this, what the US uh, new um, science foundation called the nano bio info cogno paradigm. They're talking really about what's happening at the, the new synthesis at the nano level. Then astro astronomical theory, anthropological, geographical, uh, you know, we come, we work our way down to educational philosophy and theory in terms of network analysis, um, complexity analysis, AI, and augmented uh, and intelligence, deep learning, of course, and computing, uh, quantum computing, all of these uh, elements that need to be uh, addressed. So, and I've tried to do this. Um, Paul mentioned that I'm editor of um, educational philosophy and theory. Over the last three years, uh, here's a selection of editorials that I've written around these topics. Um, uh, not only an examination of the, the narratives and the, and the apocalyptic uh, philosophy, I, I wrote a book um, um, somewhat obscure, I must say, the last book on postmodernism, it was called, where I attempted to do this uh, back in 2011. Um, the concept of Western civilization 101, this is the con this is Western civilization as a pedagogical concept and, and how it played plays out in, on the American campuses and the way that that has turned around from um, being largely uh, a positive appraisal to one that is susceptible to um, racial and non-Western critique. So decline, the discourses of decline, uh, in particular here for me, um, you know, the way in which the end of the war in Afghanistan indicates um, um, the limits of American power going forward. And by contrast, um, the rise of the Asians of China and the Asian century. Um, and, and alongside this, of course, is um, the coming pandemic era um, where Fauci and Morins, one of his colleagues, uh, indicate that this is not the end. <laughs> this pandemic is not the end, it's the beginning. The beginning of a series of these um, ecologically related uh, pandemics. And then of course, um, you know, the educational, not um, restricted to educational um, implications, life and death of the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene uh, as a recent special issue terms it, that is educating for survival amid these major ecosystem changes and potential civilization collapse. Uh, and a little essay uh, called The Last Blue Butterfly that I read about in the BBC a couple of years ago, where, you know, the large blue butterfly uh, is returning. It's returning from near extinction. So that's a kind of note of hopefulness. And I think here we have to tell a story about the unfolding of complexity and intelligence together. This is Martin Rees's point, and I, I, I agree entirely with him. Um, and I think here, um, what we're doing now is, is, is returning to the industrial revolution, to industrial society, to the eco critique of industrial society. And I mentioned Buchan, Buchan's uh, social ecology, you know, and post scarcity anarchism, ecology freedom, going back to the early 70s. Um, and also, of course, um, here, the limits of industrial Anthropocene, um, particularly with a focus on um, social decentralization, ecological modernization, and so on. The huge tangled histories, ethnicities, um, and the emergence from colonialism. It's a very big picture and very complex. Uh, and of course, this happens against uh, um, an unfolding geopolitics about the rise of China and the Asian century and the decline of the US and the West that a lot of people have been talking about. Alongside this, again, the rising interconnectivity, the new kinds of change, and the unfolding of complexity and intelligence and new forms 
of global consciousness. So um, here uh, is the concept of collapsology. Uh, Pablo Sivagny, um, Raphael Stevens, how everything can, can collapse, a manual for our time. It's a French school. Um, I do recommend you the age of catastrophe. Here's a, a key in, a key in um, dossier that will bring you up to date um, on, um, on, this, uh, on this French literature, um, the critique of collapsology, uh, the broad um, uh, types of attitude toward tomorrow, the after, aftermath of collapse and so on. Uh, and, and the uninhabitable earth um, by David Wallace Wells, one of the common, leading commentators, he says, it is, I, I promise, worse than you think. And he here really is talking about heat death, the end of the uh, food system, food web system, climate plagues, unbreathable air, perpetual war, um, you know, poisoned oceans, uh, the great filter and so on. Now, the difficulty is um, the question of whether humanity can survive this um, apocalypse. And of course, we have the same people here, these two French <coughs> writers <coughs> who are talking about um, how everything can collapse, the kind of the locked steering um, on the being, uh, being on the treadmill, uh, not being able to turn it off, the acceleration, uh, the mathematical modeling now, which has become an important part of the tools for collapsology, for exploring the mosaic and human beings and how they um, fit into the picture. So they hold that collapse is a large scale irreversible process. But I think probably that's wrong, that there are reasons to believe that small changes um, made routinely in everyday lives can reverse um, the generational damage to ecosystems. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I see it here um, in my own little village, which looks out over the sea, where there are commercial fishing, fishing going on, and um, Māori uh, have put a rahui, um, which is a kind of like a protection on it. They've banned uh, commercial fishing uh, from this area, and the fish have come back. Uh, now people can't, you know, even recreational fishing is um, very much... Um, scaled down and you know the um, um, the result has been very um, I think has been very promising. Should I say also that these three authors now um, believes that it also requires an inner journey and a radical rethinking of our of a vision of our world. Now that inner journey um, you know um, also provides us I think with the space to talk about things spiritual in a philosophical way. But here is um, a group of, of authors um, who um, now are talking about living the apocalypse. So Bright Green Lies, um, the hypocrisy and bankruptcy of uh, leading environmental groups. Um, uh, we cannot continue to wallow in the hedonistic consumption industrial expansion and survive as a species. So, you know, the, the um, critique of consumer culture, which was very pertinent uh, when it first developed in, in the 1970s with people like um, Paulo Freire and uh, um, the, um, uh, and, and many others, uh, you know, you know, it needs to be looked at again, I think, um, here's uh, Christine Keller's uh, Facing a Apocalypse, uh, linking climate democracy, another, another last chance. It's um, a dream reading theologian, Catherine Keller, unveils a dream reading of our current global um, crisis. Then Deep Adaptation by Rupert Reed, who's done a lot of work in this, in this area. The Deep Adaptation, again, which refers to the personal and collective changes that might help us prepare for a climate influence breakdown. And I, I don't think it's just, you know, cl climate 
it is, of course, the highly um, um, the highly uh, interconnected area between national politics, between global politics and climate. Um, becoming guy is another one. Sean Kelly on the on the threshold of planetary initiation. You know, very boldly, he's saying we're living and end times with climate chaos and accelerating mass extinction and signs of civilizational collapse. Now, I mean, you know, it behoves us as philosophers really to not to buy into the hyper discourse. I think it's important that we also take into account the effects of such fears on the young. Uh, in particular, uh, we, we really need to move beyond the prophecy to the action, to the action. Um, Rupert Reed again here, um, 2021, this civilization is finished. Industrial civilization has no future. It requires limitless economic growth on a finite, finite planet. Well, yes, true. But I think there are also other um, self-renewing forms of activity that provide some hope in this regard. And, um, you know, we uh, really need to focus on those. Some other titles here, I'm, I don't have time to, to look at those too closely. Um, and I'm moving through here. So um, from the French website, what is collapsology? It's part of the idea that man has a lasting negative impact on the planet. Everybody knows this now as part of the popular culture. It pro propagates the idea of, of an urgency linked to these increasing temperatures, um, to the increase in natural disasters, to extreme weather events, to the collapse of biodiversity, to mass extinctions. Um, uh, and, and these could lead to the collapse of industrial society before uh, 2050. So this is why um, the commentators suggest that collapsology, which tries to be of science uh, on the basis of mathematical modeling, systems theory and complexity, is not really a science, but a movement of thought. And it does, it, it does these cause um, collapsologists are also suggesting ways which we might survive the, um, the collapse. I'm not gonna to go too much into this. I see that I'm, I'm rapidly running out of time and I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but really we are all survivalists. Uh, what, what, can, what does it look like? Um, and also we need kind of, really, I think Harrison Stettler's work here uh, New York Times um, um, constructing an idea of, of how things fall apart. Um, you know, there's quite an emerging literature here. I pulled out uh, Fresov's um, work on collapsology as a reactionary discourse. Uh, it was published in Liberation uh, 2018. And he says, you know, um, the term collapse is far too anthropocentric. I think he's right there. Secondly, the talk of collapse is very Western-centric. It's an eco and 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 I think this concept it, it is an ecology of the rich. Um, third, the current narrative of, of collapse mixes a couple of things up here: the disruption of the Earth and the sixth extinction, and the <clears throat> depletion of uh, fossil resources. And fourth, the, the collapse discourse seems to depoliticize the ecological question. I'm not going to discuss them, leave them, leave them with you and move on to the last part of the seminar, really, where we talk about system collapse and the possibility of radical system change. Well, <clears throat> I address that for a series of remarks here. Certainly geopolitics, which impacts the international um, collaboration, cooperation to address ecological collapse, the all or nothing principle. Um, and, uh, you know, here I mention intensification of world connectivity, the emphasis more on 
economic integration through digital trade, the concept of leapfrogging, cold world politics, and so on. Of course, um, I don't know how you feel uh, with the the problem with NATO and um, uh, on the border of Ukraine and uh, um, and NATO westward expansion, um, but it looks pretty serious from this part of the world. So the geopolitics of the West and of Asian century and a, and a new world multilateralism, because we, we are really uh, leaving the world of the sole superpower. And now we have a five or six major countries here um, who um, have um, taken up uh, this kind of position of world multi um, multilateralism um, as a template for the world order. Um, I think also, uh, the criticism that Western liberal democracies are less able to exercise effective control in times of crisis. So uh, the next set of criticisms here are about weak world institutions, um, the failure of COP26, um, the weakness of world institutions to deal with climate warming, um, and, you know, its subversion by the oil and gas lobby, um, where cultures have weak government in times of, of collapse. <clears throat> I think one saving grace here is President Xi's concept of ecological civilization, which now is built into the 19th um, uh, CCP Congress, uh, the shift from uh, industrial civilization to ecological civilization. Um, and it's one, it's a concept um, um, that I'm writing a few papers around. States versus capitalist world system. Um, really here, the stealthy dilution of world environmental policies I've mentioned, the, cri the exporting of crises to the, develop, the underdeveloped world. Um, the general invocation then, the window for action is accelerating, uh, is disappearing. Um, and really, I guess, um, the realization that ecological collapse of civilization, when it happens, may happen quickly. And we saw back in 187, uh, uh, sorry, let me say that again, um, 1989, uh, how quick the Soviet system was to collapse from a country in 1991 with 300 million people um, to complete dissolution of world power within a year. And I mentioned here also, of course, post-apocalyptic survival uh, in terms of fragmentary localisms um, and what, what our American entrepreneurs are doing, uh, looking for self-sustaining colonies uh, in whilst we're in the solar system. So post-apocalyptic survival then, is about moving from system collapse or the possibility of system collapse to ecological resilience. So we're living this this apocalyptic moment. How do we how do we deal with it? Um, how um, how do we understand its mutating variations uh, that threatens to un, 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 outrun our resources, depletes our labour, um, um, and the other things here we've mentioned previously. Uh, the post-apocalyptic thinking, it needs to avoid models based on the nostalgia for local community and heroic eco-warriors, the wasteland of this post-apocalyptic survival popular narrative of zombies and walking dead. Instead, encourage critical eco-regionalism to protect community and national freshwater systems, species and food systems and reformist measures. And I'm sure you're all aware of those. I mentioned also change the system or face global ecological collapse. So we need to look carefully at the geopolitics of systems change. And in particular, also, what are the con what's the contribution of you know, science, of scientists, of philosophers to this? Do, you know, there are limits to what scientists and philosophers can do. But we are really looking here, I think the big problems are those of industrial capitalism, uh, the decline of Western democracy, new world, the new civil war uh, in the US that's kicking off uh, China uh, in, in the Asian century, um, the Russian 
uh, and Chinese Eurasian Economic Union. And I think uh, we're, a lot of my hope is placed in this concept of ecological civilization. So the earth in its final century, um, we have people who do want to say that it's an un uninhabitable sixth extension, civilization is finished. And, you know, I mention um, ecological civilization because it has become a main theme of development since the 19th Congress, uh, where there's a, a, you know, an emphasis on harmony between uh, humanity and nature. Um, and I, I, I think this um, represents a, an effort on the part of China to utilize developing regional linkages through the Belt and Road initiative to uh, develop um, an ethos and a set of practices for Asia in general, the ecological reforms here. I, I'm, I don't have time to mention all of those, but the Chinese, Chinese National Standards Commission, um, you know, look at the guideline offered here for ecological civilization, construction, na na national system uh, development. Um, and, um, and also the disappointment of the Paris Accord um, subject to hijack by one man. So um, I think, you know, there are some kind of interesting issues here, um, but one of them I want to mention really is the, um, you know, I think there are, there are um, grounds for hope around the concept of biodigitalism as, uh, you know, bioinformation um bio a philosophy of biodigitalism um which is based on mutual interaction integration and convergence of information and biology at this this is a, a national science foundation um a figure chart uh, on biotechnology nanotechnology information technology um and you know a way of beginning to look at the framework the um esd 2030 framework for achieving the um, SDGs. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that's plenty, plenty of um, um, information for you. And um, so now I'm going to stop sharing and come back to, uh, to Paul. And I hope I've given enough time, Paul, for, for some discussion and questions. That's perfect timing. We like people to speak for about 50 minutes. We're just on that point now. So thank you very much, Michael. No a couple of people have put in the chat a request, which you may or may not want to go along with, and that's that they'd like to see the slides and have the slides, or at least the text of the slides. If you're willing to do that, perhaps at the end of the meeting, you could upload them to the chat, if that's possible. Um, but it's for you to think about. If you don't want to do that, that's that's your right, of course. I'm very happy to, I'm very happy to share them. By all means, but my my technological capacity is probably limited on that. I haven't done that before, but I'm sure somebody at your end could do that. Maybe yes. Before. Okay, um, if you'd send them to me and to Judith, could you do that? Absolutely. But, yes, no problem. Um, uh, okay, so to questions then, and as we, as usual, those of you who are, who are in the meeting, please put your questions in the chat or just indicate by waving a um, virtual hand if you have a question you'd like to ask. Um, I'm going to say something to begin with about your remarks about philosophy of education in all this, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think quite rightly you said, you know, it surely has an important role to play. And yeah. you've made many large scale gestures towards the kind of thing that should be promoted. Um, for mm -hmm. example, the eco regionalism you talk about in the, I think, penultimate slide. Yeah. But um, I'd just like to think through the practicalities of this. Uh, possibly in China, it's easier to see how the policies and changes that you're talking about could permeate the educational system because it's not fundamentally a democratic structure in the ways that Western societies are used to, more central control. So given the politics of democratic education in democratic societies, one can very easily imagine, and indeed this happens, that there are measures to encourage ecological awareness, uh, recycling things, what to do with your rubbish and so on. All of that is a part of schooling. And it seems very valuable that that's there, but also that it's in danger of being a token measure in the face of something which is uh, overwhelmingly larger in scale. So yes, yeah, let's yeah. do all those things. The, the other line that you find in the philosophy of education literature tends to contrast a way of thinking that is 
calculative and that is to some extent geared towards developing the skills, competencies and attitudes appropriate to neoliberalism. And that's contrasted with a kind of Heideggerian inflected uh, receptive responsive way of thinking, um, which is not bent on growth in all respects. Now, what are the chances of inching towards the second of those alternatives, this different way of thinking that's not calculative and away from the calculative one, which seems to be so tightly linked in to neoliberalism and capitalist growth? Yeah, it's a, you know, a very big question, Paul, but I'm, I've got to say, um, I say to my friends, um, you know, here,